humanity virtuous? No, unfortunately. Humanity as a whole is terrible, deadly and insidious. But in some people, fortunately, there is still that magic that we call kindness. It is because of such people, whose soul sings with notes of altruism and compassion, that our world does not crumble to dust. Humanity. And what do we know about space? So I will tell you what for me is a proven and legalized truth. There is no force in the universe more vicious and deadly than space. The mind rushing to our planet through the universe is corrupted by sophisticated sadistic and mercantile malice, black as holes in space, swift as the speed of a sunbeam, shimmering with all colors of cruelty, like quasars and transcendent spirals. Undoubtedly, there are some intelligent forces that can be conditionally called loyal to earthly life, but they are not our helpers. They are mentors who also have their own plans for humanity and man as a unit of reason as a whole. They can help, but believe me, they will easily sacrifice our entire planet if circumstances unknown to us require it. And now admit it. After all, when we do good things among people, we humans cannot accurately predict what the good we have done may lead us to. I am incognito, and I did not come to talk about good or evil in the universe. For me, there are no white spots in this Torah. I have come to tell you that the world around us is not what we are used to seeing it. Mariam Benishu was pleased with herself today, extremely pleased and happy. She finally managed to get a job after three months of unhappy searches. Well, it's understandable. Times are not the best, and not only for her native France, but for the European Union as a whole. Why? Mariam couldn't answer this question, but something was in the air. Something was maturing, preparing. The bubble swelled and burst. A wave of strikes swept through Paris, the suburbs, towns and cities. The industrial sector stumbled, but held on and began to slowly get back on its feet. Trade and other rubbish also held on, but banks and financial organizations decided to tighten their belts and the first who got under the tightening were financiers of lower and middle management, that is, directly by Marius and thousands of other employees of various financial and economic departments. Mariam took a thin cigarette out of the pack and lit it. Cars were pulling along the highway along Stalingrad Square terribly slowly, but this circumstance could not spoil the mood of an elegant, joyful Parisian woman. She searched, fought, beat the thresholds, and she succeeded. In two days, she will start working. She will become an assistant financial expert at the Benorian Bank in Paris. The girl laughed at such thoughts, but the pragmatism of life took its toll. She sounded the horn. Well, you go faster already. A yellow Renault blocked the road ahead with its massive ass. She could have sharply ducked to the right on her miniature Citroen Ami 2020, by the way, driven to the traffic light at the intersection of Secretan and Jean Jaure, and then turned along Villette Boulevard, turned around and went home. But I did not want to drive hard, and there was no special opportunity. The high cap of the commissioner of the gendarmerie loomed in the distance at the ill-fated intersection. What have they forgotten here? It took an hour to get to the traffic light, and already at the boulevard, Mariam realized what was the matter. At first, the chanting sounded remotely, but louder and louder. Economy and labor, salary increase. Economy and labor, salary increase. That's the thing. The orange vests are rioting again. Well done, guys, but it's too loud and such a fuss. Maria, who got a job again, did not want to think that someone was not doing well. The girl looked out the open window of her car. On the boulevard near the Geot Cinema, some hefty guy in an oversized small orange vest was yelling, wildly deafening everyone with a bass voice even without a megaphone. They want us to work for 13 euros per hour. We are a taxi driver's union. This is not going to happen. Mariam listened and involuntarily grinned, imagining herself in the place of this big guy, say three months ago at the beginning of her job search. The man was screaming furiously, and an orange sea of different genders and ages was raging in front of him. Strong young guys dressed in identical black tracksuits stood apart. There were at least a dozen of them, and three of them were warming up, making boxing movements with their hands in the air. Mariam realized in just five minutes what these guys were here for. 
she slowed down behind the bus stop and decided to have coffee at a small stall in the park area of the boulevard, but it was not there. From nowhere, immediately from three sides, under the shrill screeching of sirens, three buses with Gendarmerie Special Forces left for the boulevard along the Long Canal St. Martin, as well as from Stalingrad Square and Fueto Street to the cinema. These guys are not used to stand on ceremony, and they did not this time. They famously jumped out of buses and immediately crashed into a crowd of protesters wielding batons. The crowd backed away. Mariem also ran to the car so as not to accidentally fall under the distribution. That day, she was wearing an elegant orange turtleneck sweater, which the commandos could easily mistake for a vest. Because of the backs of the commandos, their other fighters began to throw smoke and noise charges, but that was not the case. A group of thugs in tracksuits shouting loudly with various accents, Antifa, Antifa, as a single aggressive prickly organism like a powerful fist turned to the commandos and began to throw them away. Mariam couldn't believe her eyes, she even clapped her hands in delight, but stopped herself in time and looked furtively around. At that moment an incomprehensible situation caught her eye. Three middle-aged gendarmes of the same height and build, it seemed that they even had similar faces, surrounded an African woman of about 25 years old, dressed in a tight grey dress and an orange vest on top in the chaos of the skirmish. They tried to grab her roughly and they succeeded. Two wrung her hands and the third gendarme walking in front was looking for the safest way. It was clear that they were leading her to a tented van. Suddenly, two bearded guys roared out of the crowd fighting against the gendarmes. One of them had the word Chechen written on his t-shirt in Latin. Mariam didn't know what it was, but that's not the point. The bearded men simply trampled two gendarmes holding the girl into the asphalt, but were immediately struck down by the third. He took out a revolver without thinking twice and opened fire on the guys. Mariam, without knowing why, honked sharply, waved her arms from the car and screamed, Hey baby, hey, you, you run here. Quickly. The African woman was in turmoil, but in a matter of seconds she gathered herself and ran to the typewriter with Mary, who quickly opened the door. And ten minutes later they were rushing down Avenue Flandre. Listen, did he shoot at those guys? And then at my car? Maria was shaking a little. She was smoking. The African woman sat silently and stared blankly ahead. Do they want something from you? Did you do something wrong? Do you have somewhere to go? The African woman was silent. Then Mariam turned to her. My name is Mariam, Mariam Banishu. Are you going to keep quiet? Does it seem to me that the worst is over for today? The African woman turned to Mary, tears glistening in her eyes. Thank you, Mariam. My name is Avlola, but you can just Lulu. Mariam looked at the speedometer and threw her cigarette out the window. I live in Village Reef. We still have about five kilometers to go. We are far away from Stalingrad Square. By the way, you can take off your vest now. So what did those gendarmes want from you? Lulu took off her vest, crumpled it up and held it on her lap. Throw it back. You know, Lou, I'm exhausted as hell today and I'm hungry. Do you mind if we stop by my place first, have a bite to eat, and then you decide what to do, okay? The African woman looked at Mary and gratitude showed in her brown eyes under the glitter of tears. Admittedly, she wanted to eat like hell, get enough sleep and feel at peace. In a cozy apartment in the very center of Village Reef, the girls drank coffee and had a snack. And after a while, Lula began her story, which I will give further on her behalf. I was looking for a room, or at least some kind of corner. I myself just flew in from Tunisia a week ago. It took me a while to do it, but I did find a place to live rented it from one of the Bosnians in the Port de la Chapelle quarter. It's a creepy place, but I wouldn't have enough money for something better and more expensive. That same night, I was kidnapped. I was sleeping and a bag was thrown over my head. I was scared. I thought it was going to be rape or something worse, but it was worse, much worse. I woke up on the operating table completely naked, lying on my stomach. It was a room with white walls, very bright light. I remember being touched, long hooked fingers pushing my legs apart, buttocks, sticky touches, pain. They hurt me. I remember. I remember their eyes with cat-like pupils, their gray skin. And then I woke up again in my room. It all seemed like a nightmare, but when I went to the shower, I discovered it. Avlola lifted her dress and took it off over her head. It turned out that the dress was worn on a naked body. 
Mariem saw two thin snow white lines running from the shoulder blades to the lower back and to the buttocks of the African woman. The lines crossed in the spine and diverged again. Mariam touched these lines convex as if wires were sewn under the skin. What is this? Avlola began to cry. I do not know, but they control me. They are in my head. I feel like it's not going to end well. Mariam was ready to cry herself. She had heard about human experiments, illegal transplantology, abductions of women and children, but it was all far away, somewhere on the pages of newspapers, in the news, not with her. The girl herself was ready to cry. Without fully realizing it, she hugged Avlola by the waist from behind and tremblingly touched her lips to her back, to the seductive cleavage between two elastic halves, squeezed harder and began to kiss. Avlola started up, but obediently accepted the kisses, lowering her palms to the hands that encircled her with Mary, was obedient and passionate. In the morning, Mariem woke up first. Lulu was sniffing pleasantly next to her. It was nice and cozy with her. Her full African lips gave incredible pleasure with kisses in different places. Mariem smiled and snuggled up to the hot body of a barely familiar but such a cute mulatto. The hug woke her up. Good morning, sweetheart. How did you sleep, Lulu? The African stretched and laughed loudly, exhaling. You won't believe it, Mariam, but this is my first time. I mean like this. The Parisian woman laughed and sat down on the bed, showing off her elastic snow-white breasts, rarely covered with freckles. And I have not the first, but perhaps the best. You know, Lulu, I have a suggestion to continue this pleasant experience, <laughs> but only in the shower. Suddenly, there was a knock on the door, over and over again, and then they just took it off its hinges. Mariam screamed and two men rushed into the room. My God, they looked like those very gendarmes. One of them pointed a gun at Mariam and the other hit Avlola with a stun gun. She shook and fell. The attacker looked at Marius and hissed. You want to buzz, don't move, by Mariam Bebenishu. The voice was frightening and mesmerizing. It was like the hissing of a snake. For a moment, out of fear, it seemed to the girl that not a man was looking at her, but a creepy snake from a book about Mowgli. She froze. The only thing she could do was just nod her head. One of the men picked up the immobilized Avlola and lifted her onto his shoulder, carried her to the exit. The second man put away his weapon and silently, without turning around, followed him out. Mariam rushed to the window, wanted to shout at the whole street, but downstairs she saw Avlola being thrown into the back seat of a tent van the one from Villette Boulevard. One of the kidnappers got behind the wheel and the other turned around, raised his head and looked into Mary's eyes again, waving his hand with a mocking smile. It is obvious to me that Avlola, and indirectly Mariam, faced the manifestation of cosmic forces on our planet. They act outside of race and gender, age, or other characteristics inherent in humans. They consider us to be experimental animals, their property. From the series of data described by Marius, from the words of Avlola, one thing is clear to me. A certain alien race is trying to crack the locks of the human psyche, subjugate the basic and sympathetic nervous system, make us slaves, and they chose the right object, a poor, unsettled migrant girl. I hate them, these space whores, but know this. The hour will come, and together we can put an end to this. The gloom will subside, and the noon of free humanity will come. No matter how long the night is, dawn will surely come. 